what kind of monster, what kind of human being would go into a parking lot and do what you have heard that I've done? What kind of parents? Where was his mom? Where was his dad? What kind of neighborhood did he grow? All these questions, but I was no different than the men and women that you were choosing to serve in the prisons. I rebelled against my family. I had a mom and dad in the home that loved me very much. I, had, I got good grades at school, but at 13, I decided I wanted things that I didn't have money to buy, and I began to steal. 13, I began to um, steal bicycles, steal hood ornaments, soft Cadillacs, and Mercedes, anything I could do to go to school sales, you know, steal candy, sell that at school, everything to make money. Uh, 14, I got involved with gangs. 15 years old, started carrying a gun, started uh, dabbling with drugs a little bit, started selling drugs, started just breaking into houses, stealing cars. 16, life hit a real dark place, and I called myself the boogeyman. I dressed in all black. I uh, took a black cat out of the neighborhood, kind of what you see in Hollywood, and I slit the cat's throat and went to a park, lit some candles, and said some satanic utterances and cut my own self and mixed the blood of the cat with my blood and vowed to the devil that I would serve him forever. Seventeen, full-blown alcoholic, drank every day of my seventeenth year. More crime, more doing wrong, more evil, anti-God, anti-everything, just dark. Eighteen, you heard what I'd done. Out to do a robbery, looking for a car, Found a car in the parking lot, walked up to the back to steal the car. You heard Misty's story. She was on the phone, and I looked to see if the keys were in ignition, and they was. And at that time, she had looked at me, and in my mind, my only thought at that moment was I'm not going to leave any witnesses alive. I pulled a gun out of my pocket. I put it to her head, and I pulled the trigger. Certain things in your life you can never undo, no matter how much you want to. You can't change things we do. Before her body had hit the ground, I was already around to get in her car. I didn't see her body fall. I didn't know what you know. I didn't know that her head was underneath the wheel of the car. I was a car thief. I set in to steal the car. I tried to start it. It didn't do anything. I didn't know what you know that she was under the wheel of that tire praying, Lord, please don't let this car start. I tried a second time to start the car. It did nothing. I checked, it was a clutch. I checked the gears. Everything seemed to be in working order. I tried a third time. The car didn't do anything, realizing I wasn't going to get the car. I took her purse from the seat, and I left into my night of violence and crime. I didn't think about that night. I didn't want to know if she lived. I didn't know if she died. I didn't watch the news. I didn't look at the newspaper. I went on with my life. I'd had a knee surgery a week after the shooting, and I was at home recovering and hadn't been out of the house in about three weeks after that, so it's been a month since the shooting. I figured if anybody was looking for my car, surely they'd given up by now. It's been a month. Nobody's asked anything. I figured I'd got away or whatever, and... I was thirsty. I wanted a Pepsi. I get my keys. I get my crutches. I get some change off the counter. I get in my car, and I go to the corner gas station. I didn't know that the first intersection I would come to, I would be face to face with the woman I'd shot a month earlier. And at that moment, I didn't know then. I went on to the gas station, got my pop. Misty wrote down my license plate number. The next morning, Detectives come and one day ask me some questions. I said, I, I didn't do it. I don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't me. You got the wrong person. You need to go find out whoever did this horrible thing. You need to get them off the street. Thankfully, they didn't believe my lies. I was lying to Misty. I lied to my family. I lied to my mother, my sister. I lied to the prosecutor, my defense attorney. I lied to the judge. My life was one big lie after lie. I, I lied so much I didn't even know where truth was. 
my story, my life was a lie. I, I wasn't real. I wasn't me. I wasn't. I was. I lied about everything. Went to trial. Thankfully, they didn't believe my lies. They sentenced me. Found me guilty. They sentenced me to 20 years. I know 20 years is not enough time for what I had done, but at that time in my life, at 18 years old, 20 years was more years than I had been on earth, and I didn't know what that exactly meant. I, went, I just knew I was going to prison. 18 years old, I went behind the wall of the Indiana Reformatory, still doing wrong, you know, tatted my body all up, still getting high, still drinking in prison, still doing things I thought I was tough enough to do. I'd been in there locked up for about three years, and my mother told me, said, listen to the country radio station on your birthday. I want to dedicate a song to you. I said, Mom, I listen to rap. I don't want to listen to country. She said, just listen to this song. I said, all right, it's Mom, so I'm going to listen to this country station for my mom. And as the radio announcer come on and said, this song goes out to Keith, who's at Pendleton. God loves you and your mama tried and played a song by Merle Haggard called Mama Tried. And as I listened to the words of that song, you know, in spite of my Sunday learning to the bad, I kept on turning. No one could stir me right, but Mama tried. My man, this turned 21 in prison. Man, this is talking about me. And I was emotional, kind of teared, teared up a little bit. And right at the perfect time, how God always works, a correctional officer walked up to my cell. He said, man, you're 21 in prison. Don't you wish you could go to the bars? I knew what he was talking about. I'd never been to a bar where you could drink. I'd been an alcoholic, but I hadn't been old enough to drink. But I looked up through them bars. I said, sir, I am sick of bars. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew right then on my 21st birthday, 1995, Indiana Reformatory, Pendleton, Indiana, 33 1J, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was sick of lying. I was sick of my life. I didn't know how to change. I didn't know what to do. I got out that evening to go to Chow Line. There was a guy down the range from me. He seemed to have his life in order. He worked in the law library and always had a smile on his face. And I called him old school. He was about 30 years old. <laughs> um, I said, man, I, I told him the situation, told him what I was uh, dealing with, with my, the song my mother requested and what I was dealing with. And he said, he said youngster, if you want to change, he said, you're going to need to change your nouns. I said, man, I done dropped out of high school, slept through English class. I don't even know what a noun, what's a noun, somebody? <laughs> Y'all don't know either? What's that? I've got one right here, all right. He said, change the people you with, the places you're going, and the things you're doing. I said, man, you done lost your mind. I'm in this place, I'm with you people, and we're doing these things. I said, we in prison. Ain't no way I can change. He said, people in prison change every day. People in prison change every day. I know you are here in this room today because you believe people in prison can change. And I'm thankful for you being here because I learned people in prison can change. I said, well, what do I need to do? He said, man, you're in a cell house. He said, go to the dorm. I said, why would I want to do that? Man, I've got my own TV. I've got my own space. Life's going good right here. Nobody messing with me. He said, hey, you said you wanted to change. He said, you're in J cell house. If you go to K dorm, you'll be in a new place. Started thinking about it. All right, yeah, K dorm's new place. When you get to K dorm, that new place, there'll be new people there. I'm like, well, different people. Okay, they're new people. I don't know them. He said, when you get to that new place with them new people, you can choose to do new things. Man, that's crazy enough. That might work. I put a request to my counselor. About a month later, I moved to K-Dorm. I didn't know God was going to put me in a bed right next to a Christian. And in the dorm, we had to share a space, and we had to share a table. And on this table, the half this table was mine. You know, if I wanted to write home, I needed half the table if I wanted to do, you know. And he had this big old Bible on there had a concordance on there and a couple of lexicons, these big old books on there. And I was like, well, he gets off of work, I'm going to argue. Well, I'm going to you know, get my space back. I got more than I was bargaining for. He um, come back and he asked me if I'd read that book. Oh, yeah, I read that book. I know what it says. Read it front and back. <laughs> Still lying, right? <laughs> Started asking me questions I couldn't answer. So I argued with him for about three months. Then I realized I was arguing with God. God's truth and my lies 
collided. God's truth won. God started asking questions like, you know, you know, you did. Well, Lord, you know I did. You didn't what? Well, God, I wasn't. It wasn't who? Okay, it was me. I'm guilty. I did it. What now? So I learned about, you know, the gospel and the blood of Jesus Christ and remission of sins. And I, I, I was understanding this. And I was like, okay, I need to be honest. So I became honest with God. I already knew, but I became honest with God, became honest with myself. I needed to tell my mom. How do you tell your mom that you did what I did? I didn't know. Mother's Day of 1996, I just wrote a Mother's Day card. I said, Mom, I am guilty. I shot the lady at the phone booth. It was me. I'm in prison for something I did. I took responsibility. I didn't know if my mother would ever write again. She did. Moms have a way of doing that. If you're praying for your children, keep praying. Uh, don't give up on them. My mom never gave up on me. She never told a lot of lies, but she would tell one over and over. They'd ask her, they'd say, Lou, how's Keith doing? How's your son? She'd look him right in the eye and say, oh, he's fine. He's away at school. I said, Mom, I'm, I'm not in school. I'm in prison. She said, you better learn something while you're there. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. So school be, prison became my school. I enrolled first and foremost. I defeated Jesus. I learned what I could do from the gospel. I attached myself to the volunteers that was coming in, to the chaplains. Um, in so much that the chaplains and the volunteers had changed my life so much. I was 1999. My mother actually had passed away um, in 97. So I still had a little few years left in prison. And I was dealing with my new faith and, you know, losing my mother. But I was thankful for her example and her prayers. And I'm walking around the rec yard. I was with the rec, uh, the rec leader. I actually worked at the recreation at that time. And he asked me what seemed to be a simple question. But I really didn't have an answer. It. I didn't think I had an answer. He said, um, you're going to get out in a couple years. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I want to be a Department of Correction chaplain. He said, well, that'll probably never happen. Um, you probably need to maybe look at the hospitals or something. You know, the state of Indiana is not going to hire you because you're a felon. I started thinking, I said, no, I, I want to be a Department of Correction chaplain. And when I got out of prison, I started volunteering in jails, juveniles, um, different places. Lord opened up doors. I got to go back as a volunteer in prison. And it was my calling. It was what I want to do. I became a volunteer chaplain. Um, they gave me keys in the radio at Pendleton, which uh, probably scared a few people, right, Mr. Liebel? <laughs> I met Dave because of them keys in the radio. And, <laughs> and, but I became, a, I was a volunteer, and then I've had an opportunity to become staff, but I'm still a volunteer at heart. And I know you were here because of volunteering and your service, and you're asking me, well, what, what, what can I do to make, you know, differences? Well, there's, there's different things, and life totally changed for me even more in 2010 I got a Facebook message from the one person that should hate me forever Misty said I have forgiven you I gave her my phone number she called me and gave me a front row seat to my crime I heard for the first time what all I had done I learned that my bullet had stayed in the back of her neck. I didn't, nobody told me that at trial. I learned that talking to her, hearing her story and what I had done. My bullet stayed lodged in her neck for two years. I learned that I, I knew I was a high school dropout. She was a high school senior with a full ride scholarship to play softball. I robbed all of that that night. I learned about the panic attacks. I learned about her struggles. I learned about her faith. I learned about that night that she was talking about hitting her darkest moment. She was sharing that with me. And I learned what my crime had done, and I learned what I was more accountable for. As an offender, I learned to be accountable for even more, and I was responsible for So for all the hurt, the pain that I had caused, I'm now I'm learning this, and it's because of the power of that story. And then in 2012, I met a man named Jack Brady, who had met John Sage at a restorative justice conference and he brought Bridges to Life program to Miami Correctional Facility in, up near Kokomo. And Jack had been involved with it and Jack told me about the program and I said, man, I got a story for you. And I told him about Misty and he said, you think she'll go into prison? I said, I don't know, here's her number, call her. And he called her up and she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
two weeks later. I went in. <laughs> so two weeks later, she, um, uh, and then two years after that, we started sharing our story and realizing the power, and it started healing. It was in Bridges to Life. Sharing our story in Bridges to Life that I got to look her in the face and say, I am sorry. It was during Bridges to Life that she knew that I was sincere and that her forgiveness wasn't wasted on me and it was going to be life. It was in that moment. And it was through Bridges to Life. So we knew we was going to be involved. I started facilitating it. She came in as a speaker. And she started facilitating. And then she got offered um, the position for Indiana to be a regional coordinator. And we brought the program um, to, we expanded the program because it was already here. But we expanded the program. We're now in six adult facilities and one juvenile with hopes to expand into more. So if there's a, and you say, well, I'm not a preacher. I don't, well, that's good because we need facilitators to come in and facilitate the, the gospel through these small groups to facilitate the message and to allow the stories, like uh, Father Ron had said, that they're, they're, they, need to, they want to tell their story. They want to be heard. And the victims that come in and share their story uh, for the first time sometimes is just being heard. And it matters so much, and healing takes place, and there's a synergy that takes place in that healing moment that God is using the power of our stories.